Airy Russell. Bridgetown, New York, February 1962. The bone-chilling cold wrapped its icy arms around Bridgetown, New York, an unassuming, bustling railroad town. The inhabitants of this town didn't live, they endured life. Bert Grayson spent his working career as a labourer for the Conn Railroad. The company owned the people and the town. Bert knew most of the people living in the houses in this hamlet and would have been shocked by the repulsive secret they would, through the years, hide from the outside world while entrusting it to their children and their children's children. What a smug lot they were, conspiring with each other to take the secret to their graves, and many of them did. He would have trouble understanding how so many individuals could be involved in and with such an insidious cover-up for more than half a century. Like Bert, most of the townspeople worked for the railroad, building trains day after weary day. But Bert stood out from the other men in stature and lifestyle. He stood a head taller than most of the men he worked with, and he liked hard work. The monotony of it was what he didn't like. The men who worked in the roundhouses produced train engines at a record pace. At the same time, the smokestacks belched out heavy layers of toxic zinc, copper and lead. The poisonous metals penetrated their bodies, causing the workers to appear to glow. The line bosses kept the men building and repairing trains as fast as the con could force them to work. While Bert was walking to the diner, he looked up at the clouds of coal dust the train engines spewed out as they passed through town, leaving behind a fine, sticky grime. Particles of soot seeped into the houses through the unplugged cracks in the windows and doors. The thick black blanket built up layer after layer on the roofs and sidings. Hi, Bert. Do you mind if I walk to the diner with you? I'm going to the meeting at the Union Hall tonight, so I thought I'd catch a bite before I go, Henry said. Sure, I could use the company. I never like to eat alone. What do you think of the little pep talk the bosses gave us today? Henry paused, looking at Bert before continuing his thought. They have a lot of nerve telling us their only concern was getting trains built, repaired and sold. We both know from the actions of the owners that greed drives the executives running the railroad to pollute the air, knowing they're protected by the corrupt officials running Bridgetown. I agree with you. From the mayor down to the cleaning help at City Hall, they're driven by two things, power and money. They'll turn their backs on all of us, the very people they're supposed to protect. Disgusting, isn't it? Bert said. Henry nodded. As they strolled the distance, Bert thought about his father and how he recounted to him on a monthly basis the story of the Con Railroad, the way it moved into that lush mountain valley surrounding Bridgetown in the mid-19th century, building the railroad and town from scratch. Even the history books cited it as one of the best examples of a company-owned and run city. Bert's dad hounded him to go to work for the Con so he could make good money from the largest employer in New York State. In the 1960s, Bridgetown had become the railroad hub of the East. All trains going west from New York City passed through it, expanding its population generation after generation. Only a few lucky ones ever retired. Most of them died young as their bodies were poisoned by the black death pillowing from the, spillowing from the smokestacks. Bert fought alongside the other men to bring about change. They brought in the unions that grew in power, forcing the railroad to install pollution controls to clean the air and at the same time provide the workers with sick leave. Bert was one of the more fortunate men who was assigned to work in the shops building boxcars, not in the roundhouses building engines. An injury on the job one day left him unable to work. After months of bargaining, the union forced the con to give Bert an early retirement with a disability pension check each month. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to support his drinking habit, along with some extra help to help his sister, Lizzie, buy food and pay the utilities in the old place they shared. Bert, you're going to wear out the door in the mailbox. Your check will probably be in the cashier's hand when he comes later today, Lizzie said. Well, I hope so. I have plans for tonight. In the early evening, Bert sat on the edge of the mattress on his old oak bed that once belonged to his mom and dad, who had passed away 20 years ago. Hey, Uncle Bert, Joan said as her ponytail of light brown hair bobbing in the air as she sauntered through his opened bedroom door, twirling her car keys on her finger. Hi, Pumpkinhead. What's up with you? How's your old car running? 
While she answered his question, Bert bent over to lace his boot, pausing for a second to pat his chest pocket. I've got my fingers crossed, hoping the old Chevy will keep running. It's going to be my only transportation when I start college in the fall. From the corner of his eye, he watched her walk over to his side. He glanced up. Don't worry, Johnny. I'll make sure your car is kept in good running condition. You're the best uncle in the world. I don't know what I'd do without you. I've got to run now. I'll be late. She took a few steps towards the door. Bert had time to finish tying one of his leather work boots and stood by the bed. Hold on, Johnny. She stopped, turning in his direction. What are your plans for tonight? Oh, I guess I should have told you. I'm going out with Miranda to the last basketball game and dance of the season. He bent down as Joni stood on her tiptoes and kissed him on the cheek. He reached up to rub off the lipstick she always left behind. Have fun tonight. He put his big arm around her, waist, squeezing her with a soft, affectionate hug. My sweet Joni, you always were my favourite niece. If my sister-in-law had lived long enough to see you grow up, she would have been proud of her youngest girl. He grinned as Joni broke into a smile. Uncle Bert, you're like a dad to me. I love you and Aunt Liz for taking care of us after her mom died. I don't remember her, but I'm sure she was beautiful and kind. He watched her turn, leaving behind a soft scent of lavender and roses. She crossed the room to the door. He listened for her footfalls on the steps leading to the kitchen and her soft voice. Goodbye, Aunt Lizzie. I'm off to the game and dance. Don't be out late, young lady. The door closed. His ear was tuned for the roar of her old Chevy as it pulled out of the driveway. He hurried to his bedroom window, brushing back the curtain to watch the car disappear down the winding dirt road. Yes, Joni, your mom was beautiful and kind, just like you, he whispered. <laughs>